Capitol Report is a production of Senate Media Services. This week, the governor releases his proposed budget and the GOP responds. Lawmakers make the case to strengthen worker protections at Amazon warehouses and to ensure all workers can stay home when sick. Plus, the Senate considers legalizing adult use cannabis. Stay tuned for this and more on this week's Capitol Report. Welcome to this week's program. I'm Shannon Lurkey. This week, Governor Tim Walz and Lieutenant Governor Peggy Flanagan presented their vision for state spending for the next biennium. The $65 billion budget proposal for fiscal year 2024-25 includes one-time spending from the historic $17.6 billion budget surplus. The proposal includes direct checks to Minnesotans, $1,000 to single filers making less than $75,000, and $2,000 for couples under $150,000. Parents can also qualify for an additional $200 for each dependent child up to three children. The governor's plan would also expand the number of Minnesota seniors who are exempt from income tax on Social Security by increasing the tax subtraction and raising the thresholds where tax cuts phase out. The governor also proposes using some of the surplus to jumpstart funding for a statewide paid family and medical leave program, to provide the largest investment in public education in state history, to invest in housing and child care, and to create a public health care option through Minnesota Care. This is a balanced budget, but it's far more than that. It is a transformational budget. You've heard us talk about the biggest investments in state history in education. You've seen us talk about things like making child care affordable, which helps our competitiveness. You heard us talk about expanding access to health care and the largest investment in housing. And now today you're going to hear us talk about the largest tax cut in state's history to the greatest number of Minnesotans across the spectrum. We've been targeted in how we do things. Minnesota has always been progressive in its taxation with an expectation that people pay their fair share and those that have more pay their fair share too. And all of us benefit from that. Our direct checks proposal sends a one-time payment of up to $2,600 directly to Minnesota households. I'm so proud of the wraparound investments we propose to lower costs for Minnesota, uh, for Minnesota families. And there is power in direct cash assistance. Direct checks empower families to decide what they need most to make ends meet. Republican legislative leaders expressed some of their concerns with the governor's budget proposal. First of all, we've got a surplus of $17.6 billion currently. This budget spends all of that. Not only that, but it grows government by 25%. We're at a $52 billion budget currently. It's going to be up to a, around six, uh, $65 billion. Huge government growth in agencies huge government growth and taxation. This is a very, very concerning budget uh, that we've taken a little bit of time to start processing, but as you get further into the details, a lot of the promises that Democrats made and the governor himself made during the campaign are broken in this. Social Security tax, that's something that they promised uh, to repeal. The Social Security tax uh, exemption on there should have been part of the package. There's a small amount, a token amount, but it's not there. Things like that that we were really looking forward to and anticipating uh, are not part of the, the budget, only government growth. That promise of ending Social Security tax for Minnesotans, that was 100 percent is what we were expecting. That's what Minnesotans heard on the campaign trail. That's what we have talk, been talking about as we came into session. But unfortunately, that's not what was proposed in the governor's budget today. The Senate Committee on Labor heard public testimony from Amazon workers and others in support of a bill that aims to improve working conditions at Amazon warehouses. I was saying the raise, they want you to work in certain speed where certain people cannot work in that speed. Um, managers will come and harass you and tell you your rate is down. Um, they don't care if you're sick. They don't care if you're not feeling well. They just send you to a place called MCARE, which they don't do much for you. Um, the HR there don't do anything because they always say their hands are tight. I can always speak for myself. You know, I can always fight for myself. 
the majority of the workers there, uh, Latinas and Somalians, they really don't speak the language. Especially with my community, we don't have translators. As I was working there, I always told the managers, you guys don't pay me to translate. So if I give you an image of Amazon, that's the picture I will paint, is that you are constantly worried and you will not know when you will be fired. It's hard to know what the limits are set for you. Sometimes it's hard to know if you reach them or not. Sometimes you don't even know that you have a warning. The next day you come to work, your badge is not working. That means you've been fired. I am disheartened when I read about or talk to Amazon employees. They are not afforded the same protections or opportunities that I am. Amazon's policy of churn and burn treats people as, dispos <clears throat> excuse me, as disposable resources to be used, abused, and set aside. Senator Aaron Murphy is the Senate author of the bill that would establish worker safety requirements at warehouse distribution centers like Amazon. She joins me now in the studio. Welcome. Good morning. Good morning. How did you become aware of the impact that Amazon's warehouse practices were having on their Minnesota employees? The workers uh, at Amazon have been lifting up their concerns for a number of years. So I recall back in 2017 or 2018, already in a meeting with people who work in that warehouse, talking about their concerns about their safety, about their ability to fulfill their requirements and earn a living to support their families. So this is not a new issue, but with a fair amount of work on their part, they are bringing now forward a solution that will help them accomplish what they want to do, which is to keep their jobs and to stay safe in their work. Warehouse type jobs are not known to be easy work, but what sets apart what's happening at Amazon from other similar warehouse type jobs? I think it is important to remember the moment of time that we're in. In this period of time post pandemic, Amazon in particular stands out for me as an organization, as a corporation uh, that delivered for Americans and Minnesotans in so many ways when we were separated from the lives in the ways that we acquired goods and services. Uh, they have built a model uh, that is exceptionally mechanized, that is exceptionally uh, organized, and workers are a part of that. But the mechanization, the automation, the productivity rules that Amazon has set are putting in conflict worker safety, worker health, and Amazon's goals to be productive and to deliver goods and services and earn a handsome profit. Is it fair to say that what Amazon is doing to manage their productivity is beyond the current laws on the books, that it's sort of cutting edge? So they're using quotas in particular um, and time in particular to judge their workers, but the workers don't necessarily know it. And those quotas and that time become a source of both keep going, keep going, keep going pressure on the workers and that sense that I could be fired if I'm not meeting this number, but I don't know what that number is. I think Amazon is choosing to put productivity at a very high order of priority and they're doing it according to the workers and their stories are profound at the risk of worker safety. And we know over time that workers build workers build wealth, workers build value. And if we don't value the worker and their safety, we undermine the very good that is trying to be created in a corporate effort like Amazon's. According to some of the testifiers, and this goes to what you were saying, these workers are evaluated on quotas that they have no knowledge of. So they don't know whether they're even meeting it, which is creating a kind of vacuum where perhaps they're just trying to work as fast as possible all the time and just with uncertainty. What would your proposal do to change this? We would make those quotas visible. We would make the quotas visible to the employees and they would also see how others uh, similarly situated are performing underneath those quotas. We would also give the Department of, uh, it's the Department of Labor the ability um, with new tools to take a look at what's happening there and if necessary, open up audits or investigations to make sure that we are meeting the worker safety needs that are important to us as a state. Uh, 
In terms of worker safety, it is a big concern. And Amazon uh, nationally does have unusually high rates of injury. There was a recent CNBC article on that. The U.S. Department of Labor has issued citations against Amazon in other states. What would be different about how the state of Minnesota would address this? So I think it is important for the state of Minnesota to engage here. I think it's important to give uh, the Department of Labor new tools and OSHA new ability to take a look at this industry as it is building out a new version of the way goods and services are delivered. So I think, you know, I, I talked about this in the hearing. My dad built cars for a living. Uh, he used the GI Bill and went to school uh, and studied occupational health and safety because where he worked was unsafe for workers. And he made it part of his work both as an employee and as a part of the union to ensure worker safety. That's our job together. Uh, we shouldn't make a trade-off between worker safety and profits. And right now, I think the emphasis on profit in the corporation of Amazon is eclipsing the need for worker safety. So we need to engage there and make sure that we're balancing that so that the workers that are going to work there are safe and can do their jobs, earn a living, and support their families. Now, it seems also that another issue is one of communication some of these workers speak English as a second language or they have limited fluency in English. So what is the responsibility of a company? Let's say the company publishes what their quotas are so everyone is aware of the quota. How do, do they also have to ensure that the workers understand what those quotas are, that they understand the rules and the rights that they have as workers? You know, between an employer and an employee, there is always a power differential, always. Um, and if you want to keep your job, you have to understand the rules of the road, and yes, the employer has a responsibility there. When there is a language deficit, which you know we heard testifiers come to the table and talk about that, it can create an opportunity for an employer to, an exploit, to exploit a worker or a group of workers, and that's no good. That's no good for a company. I wouldn't want that if I were in charge of Amazon, but it's no good for the workers, and there was one testifier in particular who came and talked about how easily it is, how easy it is to instill fear in a group of workers if they don't understand the quotas and if they struggle with the language and they're worried at every turn that they could be fired if they're not meeting the obligations of work. That's, that's a situation ripe for exploitation and we shouldn't tolerate that. Well, and that brings up an interesting point also from the hearing because federal law requires breaks and it requires lunch breaks and all of that but these workers are so concerned about the quota that they're not aware of you know not knowing how well they're working that they're not taking those lunch breaks or those breaks that they maybe need so how does this legislation solve that does it make a manager say you have to take a break does it does it put the onus a little bit more on the company then the company should be assuring uh, that people are getting the work breaks that they need. Uh, as I listen to the workers talk about the place that they work, the plant that they work, uh, it is, it's big. Um, it takes a while to get from your workstation to the bathroom and back, and that's being timed. And if, it's, if, you, if you break the rule about time, then you're cited for that. So there's a physical problem uh, that is not being accounted for by the employer. I think over the course of the pandemic in particular, but this is, a, this is an old story of America. Uh, when you think about meat packers, when you think about nurses and working through the course of the pandemic, we hear story after story after story of workers feeling unsafe, um, of expectations for workers that put them in harm's way, whether they're worried about losing a limb, uh, hurting their back, um, or, you know, in some cases, when you listen to nurses, patients being harmed because they're not able to get the break that they need or they're in situations where they can't protect their health and safety, which can put patients at risk. So from my perspective, as a policymaker, it is important that we're paying very close attention to worker safety because it is a relationship to the well-being of Minnesotans. And then to call on employers or large corporations like Amazon to make sure that they're doing their part and in this case, this common sense measure makes sure that employees, the workers, have good information so they're able to stand up for themselves and to make sure that they're able to do their job, keep their job, and support their families. We want that. Senator Aaron Murphy, thank you so much. You're so welcome.
a bill to legalize adult use cannabis, create a regulatory framework, and expunge non-felony convictions had its first Senate committee hearing. Nationally, on average, a black person is 3.6 times more likely to be arrested for marijuana possession than a white person, even though black and white people equally use marijuana at similar rates. Here in Minnesota, it's an even bigger problem. A black person is 5.4 times more likely to be arrested than a white person. I use cannabis responsibly, the same way my husband, who, by the way, has never tried cannabis nor wants to try cannabis, indulges in alcohol, and, I, and he does it safely. There are people using cannabis right now every single day in Minnesota, regardless of the legality of it. We think the problem is that most voters who support legalization actually want decriminalization, but state legislatures are giving them commercialization. I'm the mom of a 21-year-old son, pictured there, who died by suicide after becoming psychotic from using high-potency THC products. His habit began at 15, looking for social acceptance. Although illegal here in Minnesota, it was easily accessible. At 16, our son Randy was diagnosed with cannabis use disorder, suffering from anxiety, depression, and attended wilderness therapy. At 18, he moved to a legal use state, Colorado. Misled by an industry that profits from addiction, he believed that THC was good for him. In reality, it damaged his adolescent brain. Eventually, his use led to cannabis-induced psychosis, suicidal ideation, and completed suicide. Sadly, he took his life on ju in July of 2021. The cities of Duluth, Minneapolis, and St. Paul have implemented earned sick and safe time, providing employees paid time off to care for themselves or family members for illness, injury, domestic violence, sexual assault, or stalking. The Senate Labor Committee took public testimony on a bill that would make it a statewide policy. Uh, ir a presentar mi trabajo con fiebre temblorosa de mis pies porque ustedes pueden decir y para qué ibas a trabajar. And so there have been many times that I have presented to work, not only with a high fever, but to the point where my legs could barely support me. And people would ask me, well, why are you working? And there wasn't really a choice uh, without essential sick and safe time. Low wage workers, workers of color, and workers in the service industry are especially likely to lack paid sick time. In fact, more than one in four private sector workers and seven in 10 of the lowest wage workers do not have paid sick days. This is gonna stop us from offering paid vacation time, bonus perks, um, free or discounted meals, extra financial help when needed. Those dollars are all gonna be tied up in this program. One size fits all mandates have not exactly been great for the service industry nor small business because it creates an environment in which we cannot be adaptive to really work with our employees on best solutions. All of a sudden we're being told what the best solution is rather than being able to craft a solution for that employee. Having a job that was legally obligated to support me after someone else had caused me harm would have been a huge relief, aided in my healing and increased my options. After all, it's hard to make quote unquote good choices when all your options are less favorable, even more so for those who are um, facing marginalization and discrimination in addition to experiencing intimate partner violence. Senator Sandy Pappas is the Senate author of the bill that would establish a statewide earned sick and safe time program. She joins me now in the studio. Thank you for being here. Of course. Uh, the Senate DFL is promoting both paid family and medical leave and earned sick and safe time. There are two different proposals, and you are the author of Earned Sick and Safe Time. What is it, and how is it different from paid family and medical leave? Well, simply, Earned Sick and Safe Time is for a short illness. If you have a cold, if you have the flu, very short term, if you need to take your kid to the, to the doctor, you know, a couple days, maybe only one day, may only be half a day. Er, um, paid family and medical leave is if you have a long-term situation. 
um, leave after the birth of a baby or after surgery or a medical issue for a family member. So short term, long term. Okay. Uh, you've been a proponent of this policy for some time and you told the committee that 36% of Minnesota workers, so more than a third, do not have access to paid time off. Why should everyone have access to at least some paid time off? Well, this is very much a floor. It's six days a year. And most businesses uh, would offer 10 days or uh, two weeks or even more of, of paid time off. So the reason why this is so important that all workers have this, however, is we've seen how, um, how contagious diseases can spread and under COVID. And so if you have a disease, uh, an illness, especially if it's contagious, you need to stay home. And for us as consumers, do we really want to be going to the grocery store, to the restaurant, have our children going to daycare, have our elderly um, in a nursing home having to be served by people who are ill and with the potential of, of of that disease spreading. So it's really a public health concern. And so this is really then perhaps meant to help more people who work in service type jobs or hourly, certainly not full-time workers, because many people do have access. But mm -hmm. this then, does this get all the rest of the workers and their part-time jobs and everything else? Yes, it does cover every worker and every business because every worker can get sick, every worker can have a child that needs to go to the doctor, and so we really need to cover everyone comprehensively. At what rate does this leave accumulate? You said it's up to six days per year. Um, do you get to start accumulating at day one? And is there a cap on how much leave you can accumulate over the course of your working? You do start accumulating on day one, but by an hour basis. So by the time you've worked six weeks, you have one day accumulated. Um, it's up to six days a year and 48 hours and you can carry over part of that into the next year up to a maximum of 80 hours in the second year. So it's really not that much time, not like a full-time worker who gets two weeks of paid vacation and you know three sick days or whatever. Right. Uh, so here's an example. When I was in college, I worked in a restaurant, and if I was ill, I would call in sick. Maybe I would have to find somebody to cover my shift, mm -hmm. or if I couldn't, maybe I had to go in for a short period of time. But but if I didn't go, I didn't get paid. Right. If there had been earned sick and safe time, then I could, and I had the hours, then I could have had a sick day and I would have gotten paid, but I wouldn't have got my tips. You wouldn't have gotten your tips, that's <laughs> right. <laughs> and so then that but would you wouldn't be going to work sick because maybe you needed those, um, that paycheck or even those tips to make your rent. Mm -hmm. So I can't help you with the tips, but I can help you with your basic salary. Um, does the responsibility for paying for this fall on the employers or does an employee pay into it? How does, how does that piece work? It differs from um, paid, sick and, uh, paid uh, family leave. With earned sick and safe time, it is covered strictly by the employers. With um, paid family and medical leave, it's split between the employers and the employee, and it's more like an insurance program. So it would be withdrawn from your paycheck, and I'm sure you'll talk to other people about this, but it'd be withdrawn from your paycheck like workers' comp is or unemployment compensation. But earn sick and save time, this falls on the employer, falls on the employer. to right. establish a fund that it's would cover this. Part of the cost of doing business. Several small business owners did testify against the bill in the, its first committee stop. They were concerned that it's a one-size-fits-all for the whole state, and it prevents employers from, you know, and they offered examples of, of things that they personally did to help an employee mm -hmm. that wasn't a benefit, but because they're like a family, you yeah. know, they wanted to help out. And they feel like this is, they, they said they feel like this would take away from that. Mm -hmm. How do you respond to that? Well, I really appreciate employers who are very generous with their workers, but workers shouldn't have to be dependent on having a generous employer because some employers are not and uh, would, would want you to come in even though you're sick because they're just concerned about their bottom line. So I think that when we talk about workers' rights, whether it's uh, minimum wage or safety standards or the rights for women to have time off so that they can nurse, um, or, or um, express milk, then I think the state needs to establish those basic standards. Are there any workers who would be exempt? Are there any industries or any anyone who's not part of this plan? 
we're really trying not to exempt everyone. It's my understanding that in the construction area, if they're, uh, they're under um, prevailing wage, that they already have an agreement on how they're getting paid for sick days. So they would be exempt. Um, the bill, as I understand it, also talks, so we're talking about the illness of uh, an individual or their family, um, maybe mental health, but there's also a piece for domestic violence mm -hmm. or sexual assault or stalking or mm -hmm. something else. How much explanation does a worker have to give their employer if it's something personal, if they've been a victim of a crime and they need some time and maybe they don't want anyone to know mm -hmm. that? How does that sort of disclosure work? That's really a good question. And I don't think that a worker has to disclose the details. They just have to sign an affidavit if their employer requests it, saying that this is a legal leave. But I'm going to check that to make sure. I appreciate you bringing that up. Is there any concern that workers would take advantage of this and call in sick? Granted, you're not really accruing all that much sick pay, but call in sick to go to an amusement park instead of actually going to work. Well, you know, people always um, can take advantage of things, um, for sure. Um, that can happen, but I, I think the vast majority of workers are going to need those six paid sick days for sickness. And that if they decide to take just take a day off, then they may not have it later on when they really need it. Well, Senator Sandy Pappas, it'll be interesting to see this bill move through all of its committees. I want to thank you for your time today. Thank you. The Minnesota Asian and Pacific Caucus unveiled their 2023 legislative priorities. Our top five bills that we'll be working on this legislative session aims to increase equity and opportunities for our AAPI communities. The first bill that is incredibly timely, especially at this moment, is the Stop Hate Bill, um, brought, uh, carried this year by Representative Samantha Vang. The second bill, carried by Representative Kyle Lee Herr, is a bill to support our English language learner students. This bill addresses a deep funding need in our public schools to support English language learners. The third bill is our AAPI Veterans Bill, championed by Senator Fong Herr and Senator Susan Pa. This bill addresses the mental health and wellness of our AAPI veterans and ensures that they can access important and critical veteran services and benefits. Finally, I'm going to talk about two bills that I will be carrying this year. The first is the Ethnic Studies Bill. This bill would make Ethnic Studies a graduation requirement for all Minnesota students. This bill would ensure that the histories and cultures that are taught in schools and that all students have a chance to see themselves reflected in our curriculum. Finally, I want to talk about an important bill, our nonprofit infrastructure grant program. This program was created in 2017 to su support small, culturally specific nonprofits who often provide critical services to reach community members. This program was established to help build the inf internal infrastructure of nonprofits and ensure that they can be competitive for further grants from the state or from um, the federal government. Join us again next week as we delve into more topics affecting Minnesotans. I'm Shannon Lurkey, and on behalf of all of us at Senate Media Services, thanks for watching.